Awesome. Sounds good. Well, for everyone here, this is uh, Pershing Sun, our senior economist at uh, CMHC. She is uh, presenting for her uh, fourth and final econ series here. A um, few minutes late getting started, so I won't do much more in introduction. I'll uh, pass it over to Pershing. And uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you as well, Keys, and I apologize for uh, wasting a couple of minutes fr right from the start. Um, and also, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to share some of the housing market's latest trends in Greater Victoria and some of the analyses that we produce at CMHC. Um, as, as, as Keys mentioned, my name is Pershing San. I am a senior economic analyst with the Market Insight team at CMHC. So I, I do usually cover uh, markets in Greater Victoria and uh, various different topics related to the housing markets on, on the island and also uh, Lower Mainland in BC as well. Uh, today, I'm going to present some of the, uh, as I mentioned, um, analyses and report, reports that we recently published and some of the uh, trends that we, uh, we have uh, looked into for the year of 2021. I will begin by uh, looking at some of the main drivers of the housing demand, particularly uh, population growth, uh, household formation, employment, and uh, the impact of the pandemic on these fundamentals in the CRD. Uh, we'll then discuss the resale market, uh, which has seen a, fair, uh, a fairly rapid recovery relative to other industries in terms of demand, you know, for more affordable segment of the market. Uh, we'll also look at how the market conditions have evolved so far this year uh, with a bit of a comparison with uh, different sub-markets in other, in other municipalities within the CRD. And also some trends in prices as well. Um, and then I'll also dab into how, how the pandemic uh, shaped some, some of the recent trends in household mortgage growth in BC. Um, then I'll show you our, our latest data for new home constructions where we currently have a you know record number of housing starts in the West Shore area and mostly condominium apartments. Uh, and then we'll talk about the rental market uh, which has seen an increase in construction as well in response to uh, the strong demand before the pandemic hit us. And then lastly, I will uh, finish by presenting a summary of our latest housing market assessment for the CRD and as well as some market positivities and also risks to, to watch for as we step into the second half of 2021. So, Housing is ultimately about people. Uh, in the past few years, uh, Vancouver Island benefited from a growing population, and that varies quite a bit among different municipalities within the CRD. The, every, every year for the next five years, according to BC stats, uh, there, there will be an additional um, 4,800 people calling the area home, uh, the majority of this population growth will be concentrated in the uh, West Shore area where, uh, where it is shown on this map as Western community. Uh, I think it's just a different name uh, BC stats uh, refer to for this region. Um, so uh, about 2,500 people is projected to move to the West Shore area every year on average until 2025. The other region with high population growth uh, projected is the city of Victoria and Oak Bay. So it's just under 2,000 people per year added to these two areas. 
In terms of growth rate, you can see in this map uh, represented by the red dots, uh, you can see the West Shore area is projected to be the fastest growing region in both absolute term and relative terms. So annual growth rate about 2.5%. Uh, of course, the availability of uh, developable land in the West Shore area is uh, certainly one factor attracting people, uh, developers and uh, home builders, uh, but also relative affordability in this region is also another very attractive um, uh, factors that um, attracting more and more people to settle in in this particular region. Another way of thinking about housing demand uh, is um, in terms of the formation of new households. BC Stats is estimating that uh, an average of about 2,100 new households uh, will be formed in Greater Victoria every year for the next five years. About 1,000 of these households uh, will be in the West Shore area. Um, Typically, I, I like to start by looking at the housing market in this way, because this is your baseline demand. So each of these new households will need a place to live, whether it is in the form of a rental home, uh, a house or a, uh, a resale house or a uh, newly constructed new home. Uh, immigration is uh, what I um, what I like to talk next. So in this chart, um, we can see that um, in BC, migration has always been uh, the largest component of population growth, uh, both international and interprovincial. Uh, two points uh, on this chart about BC's uh, population composition. Uh, first is that, uh, as we can see, the international migration uh, represented by the blue bars in this chart, it picked up in the last two years. And uh, it, it was at about 10 year average in 2019 when uh, there were about 66,000 international migrants arrive, arrived in BC in 2019. Uh, the second point is that um, migration from other provinces, which you know uh, had been growing over 2015 and 16, and that is when uh, the relative strengths of BC's economy started to attract people from Alberta, and that is around the time where uh, the Alberta economy was uh, declining a bit. So this flow was slowing down as you know the economy of other provinces improved and uh, on the contrary the affordability is getting more and more challenging in BC. So um, as last year you know the pandemic took hold um, international travel restrictions started to tight up and uh, what this did is it led to many temporary residents to leave uh, Canada, leave BC Especially, we saw um, an exodus of international students around the first, uh, the first lockdown period. Uh, international, sorry, interprovincial migration is another point I want to make on this chart, um, uh, represented by the orange bars. It became the driving force of population growth during last year. Um, so as the pandemic went on, the, the travel restrictions and the relatively lower case numbers that we have in BC, uh, it has contributed to, you know, fewer people leaving BC and a lot more, uh, you know, Canadians from outside of BC to uh, settle in in this, uh, in this province. If we take a look at, um, if we take a look at Victoria's population pattern, uh, the contrast from BC uh, is that the driver of population growth in Victoria has mostly been domestic migration. 
and it had been the case since 2013 and 2014. 14. So um, you can see uh, in this chart the interprovincial and intraprovincial migrations uh, represented by the uh, the orange bars and the yellow bars. Um, it has been uh, it's been the bigger uh, it's been a bigger driver than the other to the international migrations and the natural natural population growth. Uh, inter uh, international migrations uh, it did pick up over the past four uh, four to five years, but you know as I mentioned the pandemic slowed down that flow and. Um, uh, domestic migration has became the uh, the biggest share uh, in the pandemic year, the 2020. So, according to um, the according to uh, the the migration estimates from Stats uh, Statistic Canada from 2016 to 2019, so right before the pandemic uh, altered our lives, um, domestic migrants mostly moved from Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary, Edmonton. So relatively large uh, metropolitan areas where uh, either, you know, because of its close proximity to Victoria uh, and also job market performance performance on, on, uh, on the island has led to people to leave uh, Alberta for a more, you know, diverse employment environment on this island. But also a more important factor is that housing affordability has been a challenge for uh, for Vancouver and Toronto's um, for many, many years before the pandemic and people people have been priced out of those markets. So um, part of Part of the attraction for migrants to Victoria has been um, the strong job market, and this has been uh, supportive, uh, definitely, of housing demand over the past few years. So the job market is also an important indicator for assessing the impact of the pandemic. So in Victoria CMA, uh, we have seen broadly an employment recovery since the trough in May and June uh, last year. So mostly uh, these recoveries are full-time positions and which is, you know, that that is key to growing demand for long-term investment purchase like homes. As you can see in this, uh, in this chart, um, the blue bars in June last year, um, the, uh, showing that the employment was about 9% lower than, than the same months in 2019. Since then, uh, we see the job, the job market gradually inched up, um, but the job growth uh, slowed down a little bit at year end in December last year. Uh, and overall, it has yet to reach the pre-COVID level. Uh, we saw in the last quarter in 2019. Um, if we uh, if we look at different age groups, um, we can see that the the job loss were concentrated in younger demographics uh, who tend to be renter populations. You can see that in the green line here on the chart that represents. Uh, represents the unemployment rate in the in the 15 to 24 years old uh, cohort, and it reached historical highs in the summer last year. And the overall unemployment rate uh, represented by the orange line on this chart, uh, it did it did came back down to five percent last month, and uh, it is expected to come back down to three to four percent, which is uh, which aligns with the pre-pandemic level last year. Sorry, in 2019. Um, we we all know that the pandemic impacted people differently. So one one of the hardest hit sector uh, in in BC 
and also on the island is the accommodation and food service sector, which saw about 50% employment loss compared to the pre-pandemic times. Um, one of the things we hear a lot uh, in the past year is that, um, you know, Victoria being a major tourism town um, has been hit hard. Um, however, if you look into the details of, uh, you know, the job market composition in, in Victoria, CMA, uh, the top three largest industries uh, in terms of number of people in employment um, are first healthcare and social service, and then public administrations, and then um, retail and wholesale trade. So tourism or, um, or the food accommodation sector is not necessarily the, one of the largest employers, so to speak. So uh, these top three sectors, they, they started seeing job gains by the fourth quarter of 2019 especially the public sector, the public uh, administration sector, um, it, it actually saw job growth throughout the entire pandemic. Um, another, interesting, I want, uh, another interesting thing I wanna point out is that the construction sector, interestingly enough, uh, it, made, it made through the first lockdown period with job gains um, because uh, it was deemed to be essential service in the in the spring last year, but then it since the fourth quarter uh, last year, so in 2020, uh, the sector actually saw uh, actually lost job. It, it's, it has been losing employment, and up until last month, uh, the sector lost about 25 percent of the job uh, that they gained over over 2020. So uh, with, with the economic overview, um, I now want to turn our attention to current conditions in the resale market. So the big theme in the resale home market this past year and still going on uh, is the rebounds of sales and also uh, the continued high demand across all type of homes since the second quarter 2020. So the demand was particularly high in the single detached homes um, in the third quarter. As you can see in this chart um, and you know at year end uh, last year condo sales actually uh, remained quite elevated and um, detached homes seems to have cooled, uh, cooled down a bit. So one thing to note is that um, this uprise uh, post lockdown were uh, unseasonably high. And by that, I mean, it not only surpassed the level in the same quarter last year, as you can see on this chart, um, the lines are gearing towards the peak level that we saw in 2016 and 2017. So uh, what happened uh, with that, uh, the supply of single family homes, uh, it did not catch up with demand. So um, as we all know, the listings uh, during the first uh, lockdown period in April and March, um, people were trying to wait out the lockdown around that time. And those listings came up after the lockdown and they have mostly been uh, absorbed. Um, so in late August and September last year, uh, inventory of single family homes uh, declined to historical lows. And in the condo market, uh, you know, this gap between supply and demand is not nearly as large. So uh, especially we, we see that new build and um, uh, the unabsorbed inventory of new condo homes continue to dominate the overall inventory level. So um, uh, to understand the, you know, the composition of the resale market a little bit better, I want to 
um, show you the uh, the sub markets that are you know leading the rest of the markets across uh, property types and, and and in different locations. So this chart ranks uh, sub markets by sales. As you can see, uh, the largest markets last year continued to be the uh, the condos in uh, Victoria West. Uh, so that represented in uh, the, the green bars. Uh, and then the detached homes in uh, Saanich East. Uh, so that is the area around uh, Uptown and close to UVic and uh, Cordova Bay area. And also the third one, uh, the third most popular area is the detached homes in Lanford. Uh, so one thing I think that's worth mentioning is that um, if you compare uh, 2020 with 2019 and 2018, you'll notice that uh, is there isn't there hasn't been much of a compositional change due to the pandemic. Um, the most popular and the second and third popular segment continues to be the same uh, three same three um, areas. Um, so even though, uh, you know, even though the sale volume is up, um, detached homes, so single family homes continue to dominate the market and then followed by apartment in the urban regions. Um, so uh, we see, you know, we see buyers, they continue to focus on the more affordable regions or the more affordable uh, property types. So we 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 often uh, hear or see um, the word uh, urban sprawl or uh, ur the urban exodus, meaning that people are leaving city centers and moving into suburbs. Um, it it doesn't seem to be that prevalent here on the island. So the demand is continue to be driven by uh, affordability. And it's actually, it's not, it's, it's less of a result of uh, the dwelling preference change because of, uh, because of the public health crisis. So um, as we all know, uh, when, you know, when low supply meets high demand, the market pushes the price up. Um, and this is certainly the case for for the single family homes in Victoria. Uh, one point I should make is that um, this heightened demand for single family homes throughout last year um, is is no longer a result of pent up demand due to you know the short period of lockdown. The main driver is, and uh, I think most of us are aware, the, is, is the historical, so historically low mortgage rate. And, and actually the mortgage rate has been on a downward trajectory before the pandemic uh, hit us. And then uh, what the pandemic did is it sped up this downward um, trend. Um, because uh, you know the pandemic-induced recession led to the central bank to, you know, roll out all the stimulus monetary policies, and what is uh, what this does is that it effectively lowered the carrying cost of a single-family home. And uh, single-family homes are uh, tra traditionally the least affordable type. But um, this cheap credit environment made this more expensive type of housing become more attractive financially to you know buyers who have been waiting to you know get into the market. So in the short term, it certainly made um, owning a single single family home a bit more attractive. Um, but I think this also speaks to the fact that uh, there is definitely uh, imbalance in the recovery of financial situations of different uh, different households, depending on uh, on their source of income and their uh, employment.
So um, this slide, um, this slide provides a bit more direct view of, uh, you know, how how the decoupling of the housing market and the economy looks like. So um, the data in this chart is from CMHC's mortgage industry report. Uh, from the fourth quarter in 2019 to, to the second quarter in 2020, uh, which is when the pandemic uh, started uh, impacting the economy. All the CMAs uh, in Canada experienced uh, job contractions to different degrees. Uh, but many, many cities on, um, you know, on the right hand side of this chart uh, saw an increase in household mortgage and a few CMAs, um, uh, mo mostly in, in the prairies, they saw a decline in the mortgage um, issuance. If you, if you look at Victoria, um, so we had about 10% employment contraction and 1.5% uh, increase in household mortgage debt. Um, so I think this also somewhat suggested that um, it's very likely that home buyers in Victoria, uh, they weathered uh, the storm better than other regions um, or very much likely they were not impacted. So um, overall nationwide uh, in 2020, um, there were about 30% increase in mortgage issuance uh, of property purchase and about 20% increase of refinances compared to 2019. And this is certainly, uh, as I mentioned, it's a result of uh, heightened demand for uh, home ownership across the country. Now uh, let's switch gear and um, take a look at the construction and inventory. So um, the data, uh, data in this chart is uh, from CMHC's starts and completion survey. Um, in this survey that we do on a monthly basis, um, a housing start uh, is recorded when the foundation is above the ground. So, so at that point, uh, the project is committed and, um, and that is uh, counted as a starts. Uh, what I've shown here is um, the total starts for all home types in Greater Victoria from uh, January to from January last year to February this year. Uh, so you can see here it's very uh, obvious that you know West West Shore leads other regions in terms of new supply in both uh, home ownership and also rental housing. Um, one of one of the reasons behind this, I think, is that um, uh, because of the structures in, in uh, West Shore are mostly newer compared to other areas uh, in the CRD. And uh, also there, there's more developable land on the West Shore area and uh, a bit more relaxed zoning uh, capacity. Uh, all of these contributed to um, all of this incentivized builders to start many, many new projects in the region. Um, and in the past three years, we actually have seen a record number of housing starts in the CRD, um, where the West Shore area alone uh, contributed to more than 80% uh, of starts. So um, as, new, as new construction complete, inventory will begin to accumulate at different rate among different areas in Greater Victoria. So this chart compares the um, February inventory this year with the same month uh, in 2020. 
so you you can see that the the picture looks um, the picture looks pretty different in different municipalities in the in the CRD. Uh, so West West Shore, even though um, um, half of the new constructions have been absorbed between uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, but because of the rate of new constructions, uh, it continued to have quite a bit of uh, inventory. Um, and the other area that has a, a high level of inventory is Victoria West, uh, Gorge and Hillside region. Um, so the pace of construction in the CRD is currently uh, above the 10 year average. Uh, we do expect the pace of housing starts to trend lower over the next couple years as you know, inventory slowly builds up. Uh, it certainly will likely to, uh, will likely put downward pressure on price, which would, you know, disincentiv uh, disincentivize further supply, you know, especially in the condo and apartment segment, which uh, already have have the you know highest accumulation of inventories. Um, this chart, uh, this chart tells a bit uh, tells a similar story, but in terms of months of supply. Um, so demand for new home has been fairly strong last year, and and and. Um, uh, especially detached and semi-detached homes. Uh, the inventory of these two segments remained uh, below the five-year average level. So this increase in demand began actually in 2016. Uh, as you can see on this graph, uh, it resulted in the inventories being drawn, uh, drawn down in 2017 and 18. Uh, so the supply of new homes has been very low at around one month's supply uh, based on the pace of sale. Uh, we have seen inventories recover in 2019. Uh, it takes a bit longer to sell the semi-detached and uh, row homes uh, and also the, uh, the single family homes. But as uh, as the pandemic hit in 2020, uh, one uh, particular point uh, or one findings is that, uh, as you can see the apartment, it takes uh, three times more uh, time to, to sell an apartment in 2020 compared to 2019. Now, uh, last bit, let's take a look at the rental market. Um, so let's first take a look at rental supply. Uh, new rental supply is, is, uh, is a very, very important component to you know, address the high rental demand and the low vacancy rate that we have in Victoria. Uh, data behind this chart is from CMHC's rental market survey, uh, which we conduct every, every October. Uh, in terms of new rental supply, uh, similar stories we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, West Shore contributed to the majority of rental stock expansion in, uh, in the CRD. So the blue bar represents new rental supply, as in uh, rental construction completions. And the orange bar represent uh, the change of the total number of purpose-built uh, rental units between two years. Uh, so what's interesting though, is that not, not all rental completions will translate into uh, an equal number uh, addition to the total number of rental units. So what we often have to do is um, we have to uh, tear down some existing uh, existing units in order to build new ones. And what this means is that only a portion of the newly completed units actually um, represent 
uh, an expansion of the rental universe. So that in a given year, uh, you know, uh, some units can be removed from the rental universe for uh, a variety of reasons. Uh, the most common uh, is um, demolitions or uh, being taken offline for renovations. Uh, in terms of uh, additions to the rental universe, uh, we have newly completed units becoming available um, and, and also uh, units that were previously under renovation coming back online. So if we take a look at this chart, uh, we have rental completions um, in blue and the expansion in orange. So overall in Greater Victoria, uh, nearly 12, uh, uh, in total nearly 1,500 new rental units were completed uh, between 2019 and 2020. And this is certainly good news. However, the net uh, change in the universe was actually a bit lower than uh, the supply or the construction completion. So meaning that the rental universe uh, shrank a little bit as you know, many units were demolished in order to construct both um, maybe for more rental apartment, but also condos. So if we take Saanich as an example, uh, even though um, there were about eight, uh, 180 units uh, com completed over the past year, uh, the rental universe in Saanich expanded by just over 30 units. Um, we can contrast this uh, with the West Shore region where over 1,000 completions um, resulted in a expansion of only 600 units. So um, that also goes to tell that uh, not all uh, constructions of rental, rental homes becomes um, uh, contributed to the universe expansion. Um, when we talk about the need to add to rental supply in the CRD, um, I think what's being illustrated here is that it's important to bear in, my, in mind uh, because of the nature of development in the CRD, especially in the city of Victoria, um, we often have to knock down one building in order to build another. And in the case of a rental, the challenge becomes um, getting back more units than, uh, than the number of units being removed. Um, so the ideal case is to build uh, many, many more than, than what's being uh, knocked down. So this chart shows uh, the dynamic of uh, a vacancy rate and compared to the rent increase. So historically, uh, you know, rent growth and vacancy rate trend in the opposite direction. So what that means that when vacancy rate drops and especially when it dips below 1%, uh, what follows is that a, a period of rent, rent uh, appreciation and, and uh, vice versa as the pandemic hurt uh, hit us um, the economy or the local landlord, uh, all different, uh, all different, um, you know, social and economical reasons, it forced tenants to move back with families or combined household. Um, so what follows in the midterm um, is likely to be, uh, you know, the rent growth will slow down. And that is actually the case of uh, our latest uh, rental market survey where we saw the rent, the rent increase actually slowed down a bit in 2020 because of uh, the pandemic. 
So uh, a new section we um, we added to the latest rental market report is the rental affordability analysis. Uh, we looked uh, we looked into the number of affordable rental homes for households at different income levels. So as you can see in this chart, um, uh, the 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 bars represent um, households with uh, at different income levels, and uh, the dotted line. Uh, represent, you know, the max, the maximum affordable rent per household with a certain level of income. So affordable here is um, is set at uh, housing expense at under uh, thirty percent of a household income. And then the solid red line is the average rent according to. Uh, the rental market survey. Um, what we find, you know, uh, was that very few rental homes are affordable for low income households, especially those uh, households that need more rooms and more space for families or children. Um, so as I mentioned, this chart uh, illustrates how many of rental stock are affordable for household at different income levels. For example, if you look at the uh, the third group of bars under um, uh, under the, the two bedroom stock, so the seven percent uh, on top of the lightest blue bar uh, rep, uh, mean what that means is that uh, only seven percent of the two bedroom rental homes are available to households with income less than $41,000. Um, the red, uh, so the red dotted line represents the max, the maximum affordable rent, rent for household with different income levels. Um, uh, one other thing I want to point out in this graph is that um, as I mentioned, the average rent level um, on, uh, represented by the red line, you can see that the average rent for a two bedroom home is uh, $1,505. And uh, that is at the maxim, maximum affordable rent level for households um, making an income between 41K to 63K. Um, and, and note here that this $1,505 rent level, uh, it includes occupied and vacant units. So um, what that means is that in reality, the market rent of a new home is very much likely to be a lot more expensive than $1,505. So according to our survey, uh, the premium someone needs to pay for a uh, turned over unit, uh, which means uh, the uh, a unit that landlord um, remarket or uh, renovate and then put on the market, um, someone needs to pay about $300 more for a new uh, unit than, um, than an old unit. So likely a new family looking to rent a two bedroom home in the, in the Sierra, uh, they will face a higher rent than the 1500. So, um, you know, as rent growth continues to outpace income growth, uh, finding affordable rental homes has become increasingly challenging, especially for low income households. Um, we also um, have just published the assessment, uh, housing market assessment report uh, of, uh, based on the for, uh, fourth quarter 2020 data. So this report produces four indicators um, with an, 
uh, assessment on the degree of vulnerability. So either low, moderate, or high. Uh, for Victoria in the fourth quarter last year, uh, the overall evaluation is um, moderate, moderately vulnerable. And that is because uh, one of the four indicators, the overvaluation indicators is uh, assessed as moderate. Um, and what that means is that the gaps, uh, the gap between uh, local economic fundamentals and the actual housing price uh, remained at the level of, you know, moderately vulnerable. And this echoes with what I mentioned earlier about the decoupling of the economy and the rising home sales. Uh, what we found among all factors that contribute to the housing price growth, uh, the most significant uh, in, uh, factor, uh, unsurprisingly, is the low and stable mortgage rate. And also, the uh, I think more, what's more important is the expectation of this um, relatively stable uh, outlook of the borrowing cost continue to be low and um, be steady in a, in a short term in the next couple years. So um, I'd like to conclude uh, with a summary of, uh, with a summary of some of some of the opportunities and potential risks to the, to the housing markets in Victoria. Uh, we, we have seen multiple headwinds that may still be present, you know, even, even with the vaccine rollout and also uh, uh, as the job market recovers slowly and uh, unevenly. Uh, one possible trigger is that um, the obstruction on the rental market you know, as renters, the renters are more likely to be those um, financially burdened by the pandemic. Um, as, as government programs start to phase out, it is difficult uh, to, you know, um, pinpoint, you know, how soon rent deferrals will start will start the, you know, the, the chain effect on landlord. Uh, defaulting on mortgage payment, also investors uh, scaling back the investment, especially now with, uh, you know, the possible third wave and also there's still uncertainties of vaccine rollout and also, you know, there's uncertainty on the uh, vaccine hesitancy as well. Um, but uh, in the long run, uh, Vancouver Island will remain as one of the most attractive destinations for people, you know, moving from other provinces, uh, for example, retirees, um, and also international um, migrants or immigrants, because our, our local economy will start to recover, and especially there had been efforts um, to diversify Victoria's economy and job market. And as I mentioned, uh, in the sh West Shore area, there's uh, the comparative advantage of newer uh, and relatively affordable homes, uh, especially when you compare that with the city of Victoria or even Vancouver. Uh, I think West Shore and some part of the island will still uh, be very attractive to folks looking to move to the island. Um, one, one potential supply shock is that the high inventory and the high starts, especially in the condo market, um, it may overgrow the demand in the near terms and therefore uh, it might uh, project uh, downward pressure on price. Uh, before I conclude my presentation, I'd like to draw your attention to some of our flagship publications. Uh, so the upcoming one is the Housing Market Outlook, which is a forward-looking analysis piece. 
And what that does is it provides a uh, forecast on housing indicators, including uh, price, uh, starts, sales, and also some economic and uh, demographic indicators for the next three years. Um, the next uh, housing market assessment, uh, the most recent one was recently published in March. Then the next one is uh, for the next quarter. So as I mentioned, it, it assessed the current market uh, condition and the degree of vulnerability. And the rental market report, as I mentioned, is an annual publication and um, it does source from CMHC's unique rental market survey data, um, which is the only one database that covers the purpose-built rental market across Canada. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to pass the stage to Keith um, for the question Q&A sessions. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for uh, the presentation. So uh, yeah, let's open up the floor. Um, if we have any questions, oh, we have Tim right off the start. So, uh, oh, look at that. We're exploding with questions. Well, let's start off with Tim and then we'll move over to the chat questions there. Uh, Tim, please go ahead. There was mention, um, can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, mentioned about government support being phased out. And I was wondering what government support was being referred to. I don't know if I missed that or what. Right. Um, it's it's a general term. Uh, so I guess what I was referring to is the overall uh, physical stimulus to, uh, you know, businesses and um, households, be it the CERB um, and the employment support and the rental support, all of them is uh, eventually going to, I know some of them are already tra tra transitioning to different type of, um, for example, CERB is transiting to employment insurance um, type. So um, I am not, I wasn't uh, referring to anything specific, but the point was, to say that physical stimulus will eventually um, end and uh, it will um, possibly have an adverse impact on household income and then, then the, the overall recovery. And also maybe one more point, if it's, uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be, um, you know, uh, end abruptly, but um, which is good because if it's if it's ending abruptly, it's, it's going to um, definitely hurt the economy uh, even more and impact consumptions um, and then people's ability to to pay their mortgage and rent. Okay, um, does it sound like there's any appetite by the government to do something in the way of affordable housing? Or is that not on the table? Um, yeah, in terms of affordable housing, there there have uh, CMHC does have a lot of projects going on, and in terms of funding programs, there's also all sorts of um, uh, affordable housing fundings. Um, so um, many of these projects are partnered with BC. BC Housing. Um, one, I think, one example is, uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, if the audience is familiar with the, the construction going on on Blanchard uh, near the Hudson, the Hudson building. They're building a two high rise um, and part of them is uh, part of that project is affordable housing, where it, it was the the funding is granted by CMHC, um, and is supposed to be uh, you know charging below market uh, rent because it's subsidized by by the government. So that is 
that is one example of uh, a type of social housing on that on that aspect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's jump over to the chat here. I have a question from Alec. Uh, he's asking, uh, do we expect to see the growth rate in Greater Victoria to increase after the pandemic in the long term from the less than 1%? And likewise, what do we expect to see from the West Shore area currently at greater than 2.5%? Uh, you, the growth rate of uh, the rent? Level or what, what growth rate? Or I like think I th spent like popular. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Alec. Yeah. Yeah, what I, all I meant was like the population. Like, I just found it very surprising that Victoria had like Greater Victoria had like a less than like 1%, but I could kind of see that with the pandemic and like people not being able to immigrate from, for from foreign countries too easily. And that's like a huge driver of. Greater Victoria's population. Right. So I was just kind of curious to like see your insights to see after this pandemic and like people are allowed to freely go between countries again. What would like the growth rates be for Greater Victoria and the West Shore area? If that right. makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the one of the uh, not not misbelief, but kind of a misleading uh, idea of uh, population growth uh, for Victoria. It's very, it's kind of somewhat different than what it is for Vancouver because in, immigrants uh, has been or still is the the main contributor to Vancouver's population growth or BC as a whole. But if you look at Victoria. Uh, the largest comp contributor or or the the biggest share has been provincial or interprovincial migration so people moving from um alberta ontario um or lower mainland so um and that was that is uh you know uh by the pandemic because uh people decided to move to victoria from from other provinces to um, perhaps to avoid the, the pandemic or to, to, to move to somewhere relatively safer. Um, and yeah, in terms of what I, what I, what I see for, for after, after the pandemic, um, I think certainly, um, first of all, it depends on how long how long this pandemic is gonna last, um, depending on the time of the border uh, reopen again. Um, yeah, international migra migration will definitely contribute, continue to be contributing, especially student population, right? But I, I do see Victoria becoming more and more popular among Canadians as well. Uh, just looking at the trajectory of domestic migration, it definitely seems like the, you know, the, the, uh, a very nice destination to, to, to settle. And also, you know, because the nice climate and relatively affordability on housing, a lot of people moving from Toronto and Vancouver. Um, I hope that, uh, contribute to your understanding of the population growth. Yeah, that, that helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, carrying on, we have uh, Jack next here. Uh, Jack's asking, uh, with more housing be, uh, you know, with more housing being listed in the West Shore due to increase in construction, in the next couple of years, can we expect housing rent prices to decrease in the near future? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very, uh, very, very interesting question. I mean, um, rent level, uh, uh, essentially price, right? Price is determined by supply and demand. Um, it really is the balance of the population uh, growth and also uh, how much, uh, how much of an interest are people are 
putting in the West Shore region particularly. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to pinpoint a particular area, but overall, I think uh, the pandemic's definitely putting a pause on the rent increase. And um, I mean, if, uh, if you uh, uh, maybe take a look at our rental market assessment, a rental market report uh, that published in January, what we saw in um, October last year is that throughout the pandemic, uh, vacancy rate went up um, quite significantly and across the nation. Um, everywhere vacancy rate went up and what that says is that people you know people moved back to their home or parents house or they uh, or a renters combined household they moved in together um, and maybe some people some renters decided to go into a home ownership and take advantage of the low mortgage rate um, but you would maybe you know, expect the rent to go down immediately. But what we found is that it did not go down in Vancouver or Victoria. Um, and it's, uh, it could be the reason that it is a very short term land landlords or investors are still considering this as a short term obstruction on the market. Um, they are, uh, you know, for those uh, with uh, fairly healthy cash flow, they're still trying to keep the momentum going, right? So they may offer some kind of uh, incentives or perks to renters. For example, the first month's free, or like they include some sort of utility expenses, but those are not, uh, th those you won't see them on the official data collection. So those incentive for renters um, it's kind of an effort uh, from the landlord trying to attract more renters. Uh, but in the long term, they are still keeping their rent uh, at a relatively high level. Um, and I think the expectation is that the, the, the pandemic will eventually go down and uh, sorry, they will eventually end and um, renter population will come back. Thank you. Um, carrying on here, uh, these next questions, they kind of actually link back to what we've already talked about. Um, slightly, not quite. Uh, we have Charles here asking about uh, interest rates and how uh, dropping interest rates have been a huge factor for in or for yeah, increasing the prices. Uh, Charles asks, do you think that if the rate increased to the previous level, would this uh, have a effect of reducing prices similarly or are housing prices a bit slower to follow? Yeah, a very interesting question. Um, so I, I, th I, I think the first, uh, first point maybe is that, um, you know, the bank rate or the prime, prime rate set by the central bank or Bank of Canada is different than the mortgage rate, right? The uh, mortgage or lenders, they have, they have to factor in the risk premium and uh, we've already we're already seeing the market rate on the uprise um, since uh, I would say since the year end last year. So it's been going up, um, and part of this is part of the reason of this is that people are uh, I would say sort of starting to um, uh, starting to be concerned with the amount of debt. Uh, that has been taking on. And as I mentioned earlier on the one of the slides, 30% uh, increase on mortgage debt across the nation compared to 2019 uh, for new home purchases and 20% mortgage debt increase uh, compared to 2019 for refinance. So that is a huge jump. And uh, I, I, I guess, one uh, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that um, uh, if housing market shouldn't be the the a, a 
pillar of a of an economy if there's no um, uh, what, if there's no fundamental productivity increase or as we uh, econ uh, people call it the GDP growth um, from uh, from uh, that that originates from productivity increase um, housing market will eventually become frost uh, 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 frosty as in it, it it doesn't really if there's no fundamental uh, Fundamentals that supports the market to grow, to grow the debt will eventually um, become to to uh, become overwhelming to the entire economy. So I guess uh, what I mean is, yeah. So the uh, the central bank um, uh, a reason that they're still not raising the rate is because the inflation hasn't come back to the target inflation rate. So um, across, I guess, across the country and a lot of uh, economists are saying uh, there's some worries that the inflation is coming up or um, we're gonna see inflations, but um, I think as long as the job market employment or income level don't re uh, recover fully, uh, if people don't spend money as much as uh, they did before the pandemic, uh, the inflation will not uh, rise back to a level that will concern the policymakers. And therefore, it's it's hard to say that central bank will will um, uh, raise their rate. Uh, yeah, but uh, so uh, yeah, I think it's two sides of the the story is that the the prime rate is is it's challenging to say that the bank will in the short run increase the prime rate, but on the other hand, the amount of debt that's being taken on by home buyers is uh, going to is reaching a level that uh, that that needs to you know concern the policymakers. For sure. I hope that is somewhat helpful. I rumbled quite a bit. Um, <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. No, it, it was definitely insightful there. Um, we have, it looks like we have three more in the queue here. Uh, Lindby, Noreen, and then Taylor. So from Lindby here is asking about uh, the population changes. So especially with the uh, decrease in international migrants and whether this uh, change in international migrants has uh, if the increase of it is going to have a positive growth or to negative growth on the housing prices and how that will uh, impact things. Right. Um, so um, I, the one thing that um, CMHC is, um, so one data source that we are looking to find that defines or help us understand who is buying homes in Victoria is a buyer profile, um, but that is a part of data that we don't have currently, but anecdotally what I, uh, because I sometimes work with realtors uh, or uh, realtors, um, real estate board, um, the anecdotally, um, most of the home buyers in Victoria are from out of town. And that somehow coincides with what we see from the population growth picture, right? Uh, so a lot of migrants from other provinces or within Canada. So again, it's, it seems to be playing into the media news where you know people are um, people are being priced out of big cities, and there's there there's uh, looking to um, they're looking to relocate to smaller uh, regions, um, and especially because of work of work from home is, uh, is seems to be it seems to be staying even even post pandemic. Uh, remote working has been it seems to be uh, working out pretty well for the entire economy across all different sectors. So. Um, yeah, that is definitely something uh, 
uh, I would say uh, something um, particular special about Victoria's housing market. It's not, um, it's not necessarily similar to what we see in Vancouver where most of most of the buyers are local and um yeah so it doesn't seem like maybe um the lack of immigrants or international migrants the lack of that that inflow is causing uh is, is cooling down vancouver market um because you know we all see the vancouver market is still pretty hot in, in the past year um so so yeah so for victoria it's uh it's very likely that um uh, most of the buyers are from out of town and um just making victoria another maybe um uh maybe another market that uh is going to see a bit longer of a uh overheat condition Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Noreen, I'll open it up to uh, you and uh, your question. You have your hand raised there. Oh, Noreen, hello. Uh, All right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, I there we I are. Yep. <laughs> uh, I was thanking uh, her for um, wonderful presentation and the very interesting data. And I was wondering if, um, I see this, this was overall a BC data, but also you concentrated on Victoria data. Uh, do you have similar um, data analysis for other parts in BC, let's say Vancouver, Prince George, uh, Lower Mainland, Upper Mainland, et cetera, like main um, 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 uh, areas or Fraser Valley area? Uh, yes, we do have um, we do have a um, housing what we call housing market portal, where it's mm -hmm. it's sort of like a Statistic Canada's um, uh, BI tool, like their web browser tool. You can click different geographical boundaries uh, where you can see housing stores information for uh, a particular region. And then this, for some for some places like Nanaimo or Duncan, mm -hmm. um, and so all those smaller CAs, uh, you will find uh, housing data on them. And and also uh, not only housing data, but uh, uh, demographic data or core housing needs. You'll find, you know, how many how many households in a particular municipalities is in core housing needs. So um, yeah, uh, I can I can share with um, Keith maybe afterwards the link. Uh, it is supposed to help you know the public or uh, students or academic to to do housing research. So the data is public, um, uh, based on and open sourced. Thank you so much. And before I lose my queue, um, <laughs> my, mm -hmm. my 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 uh, my spot in the queue, can I ask you one more thing? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I was um, uh, for a short period of time. I wasn't at the um, presentation. I was attending my sick child at home. Um, I was wondering if you have uh, talked about the speculation tax. Oh no, I didn't cover that. Um, uh, then um, uh, can I ask you a quick question? <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, do you have any um, um, any projection as to uh, how long this tax is going to exist, and if it is, if the purpose for which the tax uh, was implemented is um, um, satisfying or um, providing the results that the government was looking for? Yeah, very interesting question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, it's not that. Um, I mean, I we we are market. We do market analysis, so we don't dab into policy making. <laughs> so that's a bit more, uh -huh. you know, you know, political in that sense. 
Um, but um, you know, yeah, the, the tax was implemented in the in the was a goal in mind to um, curb the speculation activities or whoever is um, uh, buying multiple properties and not using them as a source of not using them as uh, to, to to provide more housing supply to the society. Um, yeah, I. I am not aware of an any uh, evaluation or s assessment on how much it has been working, but I, I, I guess most uh, most of the good um, because the pandemic things has been completely altered uh, in terms of what the assumptions they had in mind when they made this tax That's right. uh, policy, right? So. Um, yeah, I, I could I, I can maybe look into uh, CMHC and see if they have have been done any policy or evaluation papers, and I can circle back. That would be very very useful. Thank you so much. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Thank you. Let's uh the great question to uh, wrap it up with here uh, from Taylor. We uh, have Taylor asking, would you urge new home buyers to put off buying a home during this uh, period of high demand? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I get this question a lot. Should I buy right now? Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think home buying buying a home is a very personal decision right depending on uh individual or a household's particular financial situation and their plan for their future um but uh i guess one one point i want to make is that um this uh you know heat in 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 buying homes or owning a home uh, and taking advantage of the mortgage rate, uh, it began to look a lot like uh, a, a FOMO mentality, fear of missing out. And especially people are thinking, oh, the mortgage rate is going up. Uh, it looks like it's gonna go up soon or it's, it's, it's uh, we better get into the market now. It's important to keep in mind that uh, you know a, a, a low mortgage rate or a five or even ten seven years of uh, mortgage term is is not comparable to a lifelong um, home ownership, right? So you um, I, I would probably caution caution the um, uh, potential home buyers because owning a home is a twenty year or ten year maybe even longer decision and uh, the cost of borrowing will eventually go up because right now, uh, I mean, even even at its lowest, I would say it can't go any lower. So there's only one direction for the rate to go. It's going up. So uh, it is a short short term versus long term uh, comparison or vision. So I, I think uh, I would suggest if uh, potential home buyers to uh, you know evaluate that and balance with personal conditions or financial situations to make a, a better informed decision. And you know there are lots of analysis, uh, interesting data from CMHC that you can you can use to help you with that decision. Well, thank you so much. And again, thank you for uh, taking the time and uh, the presentation that you put together here. It was, uh, as everyone's pointing out in the chat, it was much appreciated and uh, it was very insightful to get a bit of uh, insight as to what's happening here in our, uh, in our local real estate market. So again, uh, thank you. Thank you from all of us.